Hello and welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof. Hi, Martin. Hello, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? Fine, and you, Walter. I'm doing okay. We've I'm got... doing okay because I can see the progress of history, mm -hmm. which means that hopefully this uh, calamity on this planet will come to an end soon. I'm with you on that. Let's ask God to bless this discussion. Our Heavenly Father, we are here once again to ask your blessing on this discussion, please. We need you, we need the Holy Spirit to guide our discussion, and we need it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, you've titled this one, A Limit to God's Forbearance. Now, we've been talking a lot over the years about the necessity to prepare for the events that have been portrayed in prophecy. Mm. One of the things that one should seriously consider if God opens the way is to get out of the cities because there will be such turmoil in the cities and the trade unions will be one of the means to bring about a time of trouble such as never was. Yeah. Now, trade includes many things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't only include workers' rights. It includes transport. It, com it includes uh, food preparation industry. It includes the whole infrastructure that is necessary to make an economy work because at every level, there are people working that are part of the trade unions. That's it. So we can expect some serious issues in the near future. And then there's this economic discontent in the world. Now in this discussion, we're going to look at what is happening in the world at the moment, just to bring us back into mm. perspective. But the issues that we really have to look at is how God's people should prepare for the time that we are living in. Yes, because this is all just going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And, and we don't want to be just a news broadcaster that says this is what's happening mm. in the world and that's what's happening in the world. We want to say how does it relate to prophecy and what does that mean for our personal preparation? So it's important that we, we don't neglect serious Bible study. That's good. 100%. We, it, it's even more serious and necessary now to do that than to watch the news. Yes. So what is this about a limit to God's forbearance? Well, let's open with Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, which says, With unerring accuracy, the Infinite One still keeps an account with all nations. While His mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. And when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. There's no more pleading of mercy in their behalf. Now, when I look at some of the legislation that's coming out in the world and some of the actions and some of the riots and uh, all of these issues going on in the world and what they are based on, are they based on the principles of God or are they based on absolutely the opposite? Yeah, absolutely the opposite. It's actually turning into chaos at this stage. Yes, and the moral decay is so blatant mm -hmm. that even the most hardened person will have to realize that there's something seriously wrong mm -hmm. with the world. So the time is coming when in their fraud and insolence, men will reach a point that the Lord will not permit them to pass. And they will learn that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. Now the very last thing that will happen is to make of none effect the authority of God. Yeah. And since the authority of God is intricately, inseparably linked to the fourth commandment, because that's the one that says he has the authority. Therefore, it is a test. Mm -hmm. And people have, you know, complained and said, this is not the case, it cannot be the case. But it has to be the case. And it has to be last. Because when you take away the authority, then God will have to act. Exactly. 
So the devil will try and postpone that action to the last minute, and that gives people a false sense of security. It'll never happen. And what is also happening is it won't be as forthcoming as you think it is. It's always via a back door. It will be in darkness, as one of the spirit of prophecy statements tell us. So that's why we have to keep our eyes open, because most of the world will in any case do this thinking they're doing God a favor. Yes, absolutely. Now, is an interesting um, interview that Church Militant had with the lady who's part of Congress. Yeah. And it's very fascinating what she has to say. I mean, she sits in this great body of people that is supposed to determine the direction of a nation, the laws of a nation, and the implementation thereof. So this is a very serious issue. Of course, we must understand that Church Militant is a ultra-conservative Catholic organization that uh, probably believes that Pope Francis is more of an anti-pope than mm -hmm. a pope. But nevertheless, it's interesting what they perceive and how they think. I'm Michael Voris. The political world and the religious slash spiritual world have become almost indistinguishable from one another, which is not really that surprising when you consider the stakes. What do you have to say to, uh, I mean, you've just described a situation with America falling apart. And yet here are all these religious leaders like, oh, we have to love the family and this and that. Is, uh, is that two-faced? It's interesting. I thought we had a separation of church and state, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, what it is is that Satan's controlling the church. The, the church is not doing its job. And it's not adhering to the teachings of Christ. And it's not adhering to what the Word of God says we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live. And what they're doing by saying, oh, we have to love these people and take care of these migrants and love one another. This is loving one another. Yes, we are supposed to love one another, but their definition of what love one another means uh, means destroying our laws. It means uh, completely perverting what our Constitution says. It means uh, taking unreal advantage of the American taxpayer. And it means pushing a globalist policy on the American people and forcing America to become something that we are not supposed to be. Loving one another means, is, is the true meaning of loving one another and loving others means that you also have to uphold the law. You have to uphold the rules. And, and you say no. There's times you say no. So if the bishops were reading the Bible and, and truly um, preaching the Word of God to their, to their flock... Like and, not, and not covering up sex abuse. And not covering up child sex abuse and pedophilia, yes, that, that would be... Loving one another would have the true meaning and... Uh, not the, not the perversion and the twisted lie that they're making it to be. You're obviously you know, concerned about the whole spirituality aspect of this. You know, this is Satan, people's faith. Uh, what, what do you, how do you gauge the spiritual character of the United States right now? I don't even know why God has not destroyed us. When Satan sells a lie and a sin, it's not loud. It's whispered softly and gently into your ears and into your soul. And he tells you it's okay. And he says, it's just, just this one thing. You're just going to get it done, get it over with. And then he tells you a promise. He promises you all these dreams that, that you have in your heart. And that's how Satan sells a sin. That was a very interesting snippet of an interview with Marjorie Taylor Greene, congresswoman, lady, and uh, her comments are fascinating. Now, it's interesting that the interviewer, who comes from the conservative Catholic viewpoint, 
states that uh, the political world and the religious world are inseparable. Now, we've said for a long time that the image of the beast has been forming and uh, people you know, seem to be reticent to accept that. But it's so blatantly obvious. And uh, not only the interviewer, but also the congress lady, mm -hmm. agrees that they are working in unison and ignoring the law in terms of the constitution. When asked what her spiritual idea is in regarding the United States, she says she's surprised that God hasn't destroyed them yet. I mean, they pass laws that you can terminate a pregnancy still on the final day of the pregnancy. Yeah. And she thought that these kinds of laws would never be passed, but they were passed with a comfortable majority. So it seems as if the moral uh, barometer mm -hmm. has really dropped to levels that nobody could imagine. And there are some people who claim that calamities will come. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that calamities will come. Yes. And it will be said that these calamities are vials of the wrath of God that is being poured out precisely because of, because of the way in which uh, the political world is acting in unison with the religious world. Mm. My personal view is that we are in a pendulum swing situation. Once again. Yes. And that the pendulum has swung to extreme liberality. Mm -hmm. And a one or two major calamities and the pendulum will swing to the other side. And then the very thing that we have predicted for years will come to fruition. Everything is being prepared for it. Behind the scenes, the legislations that have come in, the messages that are being sent by the leadership and by the church, it cannot be otherwise. No, and the sequence of how things happen. It's almost unbelievable to say that it's haphazard. Yes. And it, if you look at the sequence in the past two years, you have this, then you have got the next and next, and everything seems to just happen all of a sudden to build up this. And each one changes legislation a little bit. The gears. That's no longer emergency rule. It is built into mm -hmm. the general uh, laws. So this has been planned, Martin, for a long, oh, long gosh. time. And there's a master strategist behind it, whether we want to believe it or not. And liberal activists threaten Supreme Court justices after that leaked document mm. regarding the reversal of the abortion debacle laws, and it's fascinating that the media is constantly portraying this while other things are happening in the background. So people are focusing over here mm -hmm. while unbeknown to them things are happening over here. It's true. Like one of the things that we can mention, for instance, is once while this is keeping you busy, laws are being implemented that were, like you've just mentioned, previously under national disaster. Yes. So it wasn't ensconced in law yet. And it removes your personal freedom mm. and your freedom of choice. We've had the same happen in our country. Our national disaster has lapsed. They've, but all the laws are still going on. Because they've been introduced in another way. Mm. So let's have a look at these videos on liberal activists threaten Supreme Court justices. If abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. That's just part of the message outside Wisconsin Family Action here, and it continues inside the building. What you're seeing around me right now this isn't the answer to anything. Also written in debris and glass in her office, Wisconsin Family Action President Julian Appling says the message is clear. It's precipitated by the leaked Supreme Court opinion, right? I mean, it's obvious. Madison police say it appears someone threw a Molotov cocktail inside the building. 
respect us. Respect us. If you guys want respect, we want respect too. I understand that. I understand that. Get out of here. Get out of here. I do. Just respect us. I promise you, I understand. Please yourself. I understand. We are with you. Christian rights decades long push to revoke abortion rights is just part of their broader agenda. Well, what else? What else do they want? What else is at stake? This is not just about abortion. Uh, this is about a much broader uh, set of issues uh, that are have, have that really are about a kind of white Christian right worldview. It's very important for us to recognize that it is Christian extremism that is at the root of the shame and the stigma that allows laws like this to pass, that allows justices like this to be uh, confirmed. Discovered that they could manufacture and then channel their moral outrage toward abortion, creating a new litmus test for conservative politicians. References to God and Christian beliefs are often invoked in these political instances, with some saying outright that they believe America is a Christian nation. So, Martin, do you think America qualifies as a Christian nation? I think there are Christians in America that still stand for moral values. But as a legislation and country, um, I, don't th I think it's exactly where Satan wants it to go. Well, we are back to as it was in the days of Lot. This whole debate about abortion, this whole debate about gender, if you are rooted in the Bible, then all of that falls away. If you think of the women in the Bible, their greatest desire was to have children. And if they didn't have children in Old Testament times, they felt forlorn and they mourned. And there are so many examples. And God often used the barren woman as a symbol of his church, but also as a symbol of the promise that the Messiah would come. And uh, if you look at the creation account, when God formed man, he formed him out of the dust of the earth. He didn't speak him into existence. Mm. He didn't speak him into existence like the rest of creation. He formed him. He lovingly formed them into a male and a female. There was nothing in between. And uh, the Bible makes all these things very clear. Yeah. And the sanctity of life is ensconced in the biblical narrative. You have the value of life. How valuable is a human life? So valuable that God decided he should die for one. Exactly. And if there was just one, he would have died for that one. That's the value. You read Psalms 8. What is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, you have this depiction that man is but a worm. But that's not how it should be read. It should be read, what is man that you are so mindful of him? What do you see in him that you are worth, that you are willing to die for him? So the value of human life is indescribable and uh, and that's also what's happening now the value of another human being is if you look at this video that we've just looked where do you see value for another person's life in this yeah. it's also showing me or it makes me think if you put this in the prophetic picture 
when the dragon is wroth with a remnant of a seed and they will go after the commandment keeping people, this is what it's going to look like. But Martin, the deception runs so deep and this is what people have to take cognizance of. There are people that have values, Christian values, in the United States, in other nations as well. But particularly in the United States, you have the Bible Belt. You have you know, this, this great uh, depth of Christian values. And there will be an outrage when Christians think about what is happening in mm -hmm, the world. Mm -hmm. So that when calamities should come, mm -hmm. they will easily be swayed to say, these are the judgments of God for what is happening in the world. But what is the solution? Back to moral values. Yes. Whose moral values? Theirs, not and God's. The Catholic conservative That's... movement. We have to get back to moral values. And that includes the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. Exactly. That's what makes it so deceitful sometimes. Because that morality that you have when you watch a video like we've just shown is you want to side with the side that says, yes, we have to sort this out. We have to get morality back. Yes. But then you can also stand on the wrong side. You fall into that next trap. It's such a terrible deception. So besides the moral issue, mm. let's not go no. deeply into, you know, whether this is right or whether that is right. Anybody who has even a very limited idea of what the scriptures have to say will realize that the world is in a deep state of disease. Yes. And the important thing, like we just mentioned, to remember is that the Christian moral value will take over. But then, like you've mentioned, it will be the Catholic one that's reigning supreme. It's interesting that this lady particularly had this interview with the conservative arm of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. But there are other issues which are facing us, which are also, of course, biblical. And will be drawn back into the whole scenario eventually. Now, this, besides the moral decline and the political mileage that the powers that be will get out of the moral decline. We also have the issue of famine, threatening famine. And here the World Bank warns about food security. Many countries are facing growing levels of food insecurity, reversing years of development gains, and threatening the achievement of sustainable development goals by 2030. Now, Martin, who was responsible for reversing the capacity to produce food and to distribute food? Well, this war that's reigning in Russia. To that, together with COVID and the supply lines being removed, it seems improbable that these are just uh, events that take place without any planning whatsoever. Because it's so orchestrated, it is so universal, it is so, so smooth in its action that it's difficult to think that it's not planned. And it plays so well into their hands, if, into the scenario. Yes, exactly. If you want a great reset, then that is exactly what needs to happen. As of May 5, 2022... The agricultural price index is up 41% compared to January 2021. Maize and wheat prices are 54% and 60% higher, respectively, compared to January 2021. According to the World Bank's April 2022 commodity market outlook, the war in Ukraine has altered global patterns of trade, production and consumption in ways that will keep prices at historically high levels through the end of 2024, exacerbating food insecurity and inflation. One crisis in Ukraine and the whole world is suddenly lame. 
Do you buy that, Martin? No, it doesn't make sense because what about the other wars that happened and this never happened before? Over the coming months, a major challenge will be access to fertilizers, which may impact food production across many crops in different regions. Fertilizer prices surged in March, up nearly 20% since January 2022 and almost three times higher compared to a year ago. Now, we've said for a long, long time that we need to grow our own vegetables. And uh, we've spoken about the necessity of organic farming. We don't need all of these fertilizers. And these are not things that happen overnight. No. You have to work at it. You have to you know, implement it. You have to experiment. You have to see how this works. You have to improve your soil. And all of these issues, that is why it is important that people listen to what we have been admonished to do. Correct. Get out and start implementing these things. And if you can't get out, there are alternatives. Yes. You have to start preparing. You know, I've heard some people send us messages. Now, when the Sunday law comes in, then we have to start looking after ourselves. Well, then it will be, last events will be rapid ones. You need some time for preparation. You know, if you're stuck in the city, at least get hold of a lot of seeds so that you can grow some microgreens. And uh, do a little bit of preparing. Store some things which, which will last, like dried beans and grains and things like that. One has to start looking at the world and saying, there are serious things happening. The other thing that is happening is that the food processing plants in the world, mm -hmm. are seemingly under attack. And they say these are you know, accidents that happen by chance, but they are so regular and they target such specific industries that it is likely that some of this is orchestrated as well. Well, even if you want to go the route of saying, no, this is not, the outcome is the same. Is the same because this is heading for a trouble. Yes, and uh, even if, if man has nothing to do with it, mm. demonic forces behind the scenes do have something to do with it. So let's have a look at this little compilation. Eastern Oregon, where crews are battling a major fire at a potato chip processing plant. Air 12 flew over the scene at Shearer's Foods on Highway 207 in Hermiston. We're told the fire was caused by an explosion of a portable boiler there. Two people were taken to the hospital. There is a fascinating common denominator, which is that all of these dangerous episodes happened at plants or facilities that process or store food. And of course, with inflation, food shortages, supply chain problems, and the war in Ukraine, the timing here could not be worse. We should note that over the past several years, major incidents at food plants have happened on a fairly regular basis, but it is the recent and dramatic increase in frequency that really caught our eye. And in the span of just one week, during the safest point in aviation history, we also had two planes that crashed into food plants. Well, I think the video speaks for itself. What do you think? Yeah. So let's just look at this little list here as to what's been happening just in 2022. And you have all the dates here. And you can see there we're talking about April going back to 2019, August 9. And most of it here is in 2022 on this list. And the food plants that were... Uh, targeted or that experienced these problems. Uh, here they are, a whole list of them, and uh, they're quite substantial. And uh, in different states as well. Yes, they're all over, the, all over the United States. Locations are in Oregon, in Idaho, in Arizona, etc., right across the board. And what was the main reason? Fire, airplane crash explosions, and this could be pure chance, Martin, but it could also be a planned action to bring about a time of trouble such as never 
or wives. Yeah, like you mentioned before, the Bible mentions famine. How it be- came to a famine doesn't really matter. No. Because either way, if this was orchestrated or not, the outcome is the same. Now imagine if you had a crop failure. Hmm. And the crop failure could be blamed on a lack of fertilizer exactly. and can be blamed on Ukraine, Russian. And then uh, the nice big one, climate change. And climate change. Because this is where it all links together. We'll be getting to that. Well, then it could be very interesting. So let's look at climate change and see how that fits in. Here's an article in The Guardian. Northern Ireland faces loss of one million sheep and cattle to meet climate targets. Northern Ireland will need to lose more than one million sheep and cattle to meet its newly legally binding climate emission targets, according to an industry commission analysis seen by The Guardian. The large-scale reduction in farm animals comes after the passing of the jurisdiction's first-ever climate act, requiring the farming sector to reach net zero carbon emission by 2050 and reduce methane emissions by almost 50% over the same period. Now, it's well known that when cattle and herbivores in general, and ruminants in particular, that's all your clean animals, like sheep and goats and cattle, when they digest their foods, the byproduct is methane production. And there is a vast amount of methane that is produced in this fashion. So they will have to reduce that, and the way to do that is to get rid of the animals. Now, some may say that that would seem to indicate that we have to go the vegetarian route. But that means all of these farmers must be redirected into alternative farming. And once you've done all that, then you have to basically become proficient in what you are doing. And you have to do it very quickly. So <laughs> before the, the changeover takes place, you can have serious effects on food production. Definitely. This is not just, I mean, if you take a normal farm, changing an, one farm over to something like this, a net zero emission farm, it's not going to be cheap. No, and it's not going to happen overnight either. And it won't, the su- success of it is also not guaranteed. No. So separate analysis by the UK government's climate advisors suggests chicken numbers would also need to be cut by 5 million by 2035. Both the pig and poultry sectors in Northern Ireland have seen rapid growth in the past decade. So this is where we're heading. They're going to change the entire agricultural sector. But you must remember that big corporations have bought up the farmland. Mm -hmm. Like Bill Gates is one of the largest farm owners in the world. Vast tracts. And uh, they have the capacity to do exactly what they want. They could let it lie fallow. What then? Exactly. If you take countries like Southern Africa where you had many farms that were land claimed, they just went back to being what they were before with no production or zero production on them. So these are all very interesting things that are happening in the world, worldwide. That's it. And what happened also is a lot of the countries that were producing started getting um, reliant on imports. But if a country itself can't produce enough anymore, it's not going to export, so those countries that import it are going to sit with a big problem as well. And then, of course, you have the constant threat of more epidemics. So, Martin, this is like a Bible script being read all over again in the news media. Mm. There will be famines, there will be moral decay, and there will be pestilences. So Bill Gates warns of a more fatal COVID variant, calls for global surveillance. Mm. Aren't you grateful that we have these people that are so au fait? And he's been rather silent of late because he was writing a book, right? Mm. He's been writing a book lately on pandemics. Uh, I'll make sure that I don't buy it because I have better things to read like, like this good book over here. 
and I need to prepare for what the Bible says is coming to the world. But, you know, let the gentleman write his books. It keeps him busy. And he's talking about the world was not ready for the inevitable next pandemic. And that viruses, not war, pose the greatest risk of global catastrophe. You know, Martin, I've been living quite a few years on this planet, and all of a sudden, there are so many viral catastrophes going around that one would believe that it's always been like that. Mm. I'm sure the young generation is so conditioned already, they oh, yeah. think it's normal. Yes, and especially, I think the generations, the younger generations are very much indoctrinated at this stage and fearful. Yes, for what is about to come. So he called for renewed efforts for greater investments in global surveillance of viruses, which has been paused by a number of countries in the wake of decline in COVID cases. So let's have more legislation. Let's have more surveillance. Surveillance, this word, this word you, we have to look at. And remember, whether you are rich or whether you are poor, or whether you are of high standing or whether you are of a lower standing, you will have to comply to the mark of the beast. Nobody will be exempt. Do you need ultra-effective surveillance in order to do that? Definitely. Are they implementing yeah. it? Well, let's have a look. May 3, 2022, CDC tracked millions of phones to see if Americans followed COVID lockdown orders. So are they doing it? They are doing it. And once again, how do we have to look at this? Just about the news article and no. what they're doing. No, we have to look at it in terms of the prophetic picture. So who is this going to target eventually? And this is the CDC. Mm -hmm. So this is not some alternative media. I wonder whether we should fact check the CDC. Oh, just a reminder on that. When you put in proce food processing plants disasters, just those words, go and see. The first page is fact checkers. <laughs> <laughs> then you must start worrying. Yes, because the fact checkers, we know where they come from. Newly released documents showed the CDC planned to use phone location data to monitor schools and churches. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting, Martin? And wanted to use the data for many non-COVID-19 purposes too. Location data, information on a device's location sourced from the phone, which can then show where a person lives, works, where they went. The sort of data the CDC bought was aggregated, meaning it was designed to follow trends that emerge from movements of groups of people. But researchers have repeatedly raised concerns with how location data can be de-anonymized and used to track specific people. Hey. Now we're getting there. What, according to the Bible, is that group or who belongs to that group that will be specifically targeted? The commandment-keeping people. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now you see, they won't be the only ones targeted. No, there will be others as well. But this all will come to that point if you qualify for that part of keeping the commandments. All right. Now, we've, we've said all along that uh, the social credit system that the Chinese have introduced is something that is alive and well and coming to your city soon mm -hmm. and your country. Here's Christianity Daily, and it says social credit scoring system designed to modify behavior launched in Italy. Well, they always start you know, gently in one nation, then it goes to the next and the next. It is a given, according to the scriptures, that this will take place. We don't even have to read this article because, you know, they're going to link it to your pocket, smart citizen wallet. When you do certain things, you get certain incentives. Mm. But remember, this is done for climate change. And what is Pope Francis's Laudato Si? 
encyclical ensconced, what's ensconced in there for climate change? Sunday legislation. So this is tracking, tracing with surveillance. Yes. And now it's linked to a social credit system for climate change. So just look how all of this is being linked together. People think that when you say Sunday legislation, that you are on some religious bandwagon and uh, some of the talk show hosts have said that's never going to happen. Well, they are like ostriches because it's happening all over. It's particularly prominent even in non-Christian countries. But, you know, maybe we shouldn't call it Sunday legislation. Maybe we should just say legislation making of non-effect the authority of God. Yeah. That's a very good point. That's the way we should see it. And that's exactly what they're going to do. And they're going to watch your behavior because certain people will have to be targeted. You see, the, the easy way to implement these things is using climate change because that word, everybody is sensitive to it, yes. if you understand. They, okay, I understand. It's for climate change. So it's for a good, it's for a common good. For the common good. And, of course, the climate change will be linked to a common day of rest. That's the thing. Because they've already introduced that, the Sunday rest, because of climate change. So you have a car-free Sunday mm -hmm. in many countries. So it's coming sort of slowly. And you see, the problem is that even if you are a commanding-keeping pe person, it can look okay to you to do all these things. Yes, you might actually go along with it. So here's an article from Reuters. The heat is on. Italy plans to turn down air conditioning to save energy. Italians could face a long, hot summer with the air conditioning turned down in public offices and buildings as the government seeks to reduce its reliance on Russian gas supplies. So you bring in the war, you bring in uh, the climate change issue, and it's all leading in a particular direction. Air conditioning systems will be set to keep the temperatures no lower than a balmy 25 to 27 Celsius during the warmest months of the year, according to an amendment to a government decree on energy usage. In the winter, rooms will not be heated beyond a maximum of 19 to 21 Celsius under rules due to come into force from the start of May to the end of next March. So, Martin, they're using any pretext, whether it is a war mm -hmm. in the Ukraine, whether it is climate change, people are channeled into different modes of lifestyle, and they will have to ramp up their rhetoric so that eventually they will have to have work-free days in order to save energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. And which days will that be, Martin? <laughs> There's only one. There's only one. It definitely won't work on any other day than Sunday. No. Here is CNN politics. DOJ announces new offers to enforce laws around climate crisis, toxic pollution. Garland said the OEJ will serve as the central hub for our efforts to advance our comprehensive environmental justice enforcement strategy. They have such nice-sounding hmm. titles to their strategies. With the office working alongside a number of other intra-departmental agencies, including the Civil Rights Division and the United States Attorney's offices, to prioritize meaningful and constructive engagement with the communities most affected by environmental crime and injustice. Civil Rights Division, isn't that um, unions? Absolutely. So legislation and unions for climate change. Yes, but look how they link crime and injustice mm. to this as well. So they're making a sort of smorgasbord with all of these parameters included. That's the thing. The one that they actually want to do is here, but not to make it so obvious. You ensconce it with all the rest of all this injustice because you would look like a buffoon if you say it's not immoral to have people drink sewage water. Yes. But now you bring climate change in with it. Very, very clever. Here's an article in The Verge. Watch a swarm of drones 
autonomously track a human through a dense forest. The surveillance is so sophisticated mm -hmm. these days. It's like something out of a movie. You see, 10, 20 years ago, you had these, thing, these drones type of technology. Now it's, it's a reality. It's a reality. So if you're living somewhere tucked away in a forest, they can still come and get you, right? These things are as big as your palm. And some of them are smaller. Some of them are the sizes of insects. Yeah. And they can sneak in through <laughs> cracks in the doorways. So the group of 10 palm-sized drones communicate with one another to stay in formation, sharing data collected by onboard depth sensing cameras to map their surroundings. If one drone loses sight of the target, others are able to pick up the trail. And the capability to navigate cluttered environments, for example, is desirable for a range of military purposes, including for urban warfare, Schwartz tells The Verge, as is the ability to follow a human. Here I can see how this converges with projects that seek to develop lethal drone capabilities that minimize risk to on-the-ground soldiers in urban environments. Weiner said in the 1960s that there is a disastrous focus and obsession with know-how which tends to eclipse the moral question we should be asking, what is it good for? So the fact that they have the capability mm. is a good indication that they want to use it. And there's always the nice part. They want to use it for disaster relief, finding people that... Uh, and with, lost and now you, you must always think what we've just mentioned what is the outcome where are we heading now we have no intention to be fear mongering no, in no, any way no. because if you have the Lord on your side I don't care what technology they throw at you it would be totally meaningless if God wants to prevent their usage he will mm -hmm. so let's have a look how this thing works So, Martin, basically you have nowhere to hide, right? Yeah, so surveillance, we've mentioned that is what they want to implement for looking after climate change and all of this. So, do you think they will use some of this technology in that? So, when the Bible says that everyone, great and small, rich and poor, will have to make this decision, mm. there's nobody that can hide. No. So how's that possible? Well, they have the technology to find you no matter where you are. So whether you like it or not, you'll have to make a decision. And the decision is, who is your moral authority? And if you've made the decision that God is your moral authority, you will be in opposition to the law. That's it. That's what's going to happen. So how far is this going and how is it being implemented? Now, 
Martin, you included an interesting slide here on climate and sustainability summits. Run us through this one. Well, it was just interesting to me that the accounting bodies in South Africa, which I was part of when I previously worked, I'm still part of them, so I get updates and so on. And in South Africa, this sustainability on climate change, it is a big thing. It's written into our law, and now there's summits. It's just, I just put it in to show that everybody is on board with this climate agenda. It is like a tentacle that has gone right across the globe. If it's you, not just a, a feature that people are just talking about. This is actually being implemented on a universal scale. That's it. And it's going to affect everybody. Even if you are a salaried person or you are a main business. This is already affecting everybody. So the laws will eventually go to what Pope Francis wants it to go to. And what is permitted on certain days and what is not permitted on other days. Now, here's an interesting video about China. And, of course, they're starting with uh, zero COVID. But what if they want to test for other things like zero carbon emission mm -hmm. or a compliance to whatever they want to introduce? Let's see how far this technology has taken us. Now to China, where none of the citizens have the power of choice unless you are Xi Jinping, in which case you get to do pretty much what you want, whether it works or not. The Chinese president's word is the law. He has issued a new diktat to his officials. He wants a crackdown on those who question his zero COVID policy. Health authorities are now resorting to extreme measures. This is one of the testing centers in China. Here, one of the citizens was pinned down to the ground. She was forced to take a Wuhan virus test. Such tests are now mandatory in all hotspots. Those who refuse are subjected to force. Chinese health officials are barging into homes to hunt down violators. Even the elderly are not spared, like this woman. She was pushed out of her home to take a test. <laughs> Who issued these draconian orders? The instructions come from the top. Despite its obvious failures, Chinese President Xi Jinping is not ready to give up on zero COVID. Now he wants officials to crack down on those who question it. Recently, Xi Jinping chaired a meeting of the Politburo Standing Committee. This is the top decision-making body in China. The Chinese president had a clear message for them. Those who question, distort or reject zero COVID should be punished. <laughs> Xi Jinping faces a massive public outcry. The lockdowns have led to a backlash. The city of Shanghai rebelled last month. Hundreds of residents banged their pots and pans in protests. China's policies have taken a toll on its citizens. Going by Xi Jinping's message, their misery may not end anytime soon. Now, anybody living in the West will be appalled when they see something like this, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would suggest they look back in history at what happened in the Middle Ages when the Church of Rome had full sway. If you didn't comply, then you were treated far worse than, than what the Chinese are doing now. Far worse. You were placed into custody. You were tortured. Have you ever been to those museums where they show the torture instruments yes. that were used in the Middle Ages? The I mean, Tower of London? Yes. It's horrendous. Even if you then take not so long ago, some Western countries implemented similar draconian yes. 
rules for people that didn't want to do some things. And even in the time of Franco in Spain, they still used those instruments of torture that the Inquisition used. Mm. Now, people are often duped into thinking that the communist regime is actually against religion or against Catholicism. Mm. But we should remind the listeners that communism was perfected by the Jesuits in their reductions in South America and that the countries that we are talking about are actually running on Jesuit principles. Yes. So it's interesting when you read, for example, that uh, the BBC reported here uh, that Hong Kong Cardinal Joseph Zen was arrested under China's security law. And the Hong Kong police told the BBC that the group was suspected of appealing to foreign countries or organizations to impose sanctions on Hong Kong and threatening China's national security. Arresting a 90-year-old cardinal for his peaceful activities has to be shocking new low for Hong Kong, illustrating the city's free fall in human rights in the past two years. So Human Rights Watch said the Vatican is concerned about the Cardinal's arrest, spokesman Matteo Bruni said in a statement. Scores of pro-democracy activists and protesters in Hong Kong have been arrested under the national security law since it was imposed by China in 2020. So what it appears like is that the Chinese government is being very harsh to even the religious bodies. And it's been kept under the garb for national security. Yes. Now, this is something that creates sympathy with the church, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a 90-year-old gentleman that was here arrested. What is the real position of the Roman Catholic Church with regards to China's policies? Well, here's the Catholic Register, February 6, 2018, which spells it out quite clearly. It's quite a while ago, but this is what they're saying. China is a model of Catholic social teaching, protector of human dignity, Bishop says. The Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences has said that China is exercising global moral leadership in the principles of Catholic social teaching and defense of human dignity. In an interview with the Vatican Insider, he recently said that at this moment, those who best realize the social doctrine of the church are the Chinese. What do you say to that, Mark? I don't know how they bring these two together, the, what we've just watched in that video, and also, and people might say, okay, yeah, but this is now and that was then. It, well, it was the same in 2018. Why were the Jesuits created? To destroy Protestantism. And they wanted to go back to the Middle Ages where the church had total control over humanity. That's right? it. If you didn't comply, you were whisked off and you ended up in some dungeon. And uh, if you didn't change your mind mm -hmm. and recant, you were tortured and even tortured to death. And they used the state to do it for That's them it. so that they sanctimoniously could say that it wasn't them, but it was according to their laws. Mm. Now, let's go to the communist countries. What did the KGB do? They do exactly the same. Mm? And that's what I... If you take social doctrine is common good, China says... They did it for their own national security, yes. for their common good. And people have to comply to whatever it is they say. Who's pulling the strings behind the scenes? I think we can fairly confidently say, might be coming to a city near you. Yes. So what else did he say? So Rondo told Vatican Insider that he had recently visited China where he says he found that they, the Chinese... Seek the common good, subordinate things to the general good. The common good. You better comply. You may have no opinion of your own. To be subject to the Roman pontiff is altogether necessary for salvation, she claimed in the Middle Ages. Well, we've had articles where 
Jesuits have longed for the good old bad old days mm. to return. Do you remember that? Yeah. The bishop said that the People's Republic of China has defended the di dignity of the human person and in the area of climate change is assuming a moral leadership that others have abandoned. He criticized the United States where he said the economy dominates politics. Liberal thought has liquidated the concept of the common good. They do not even want to take it into account. It affirms that it is an empty idea without any interest. On the other hand, he said, the Chinese propose work and the common good. So they are a model of Catholic social doctrine. And where does that emanate from? From the schoolmasters of the world, namely the Jesuits. It is surprising to me that Protestants, even from our own denomination, are proud when they study at institutions mm. that the Jesuits have raised up, even Georgetown University. How, if we look at the history, can we marry the attitude and the social teaching of this institution that has caused so much bloodshed over the, over the years and over the centuries, and over the millennia, how can we incorporate that into our moral parameters today? So just to make sure that people understand where this is all leading, let's just put in a few slides to show how they're going to link the Sunday. And we said, not the Sunday, the moral authority of God versus the moral authority of the church. How are they going to link it yes. to all of this? Here's the Business Insider of 18 March 2020. World Agency suggests lowering speed limit by 10 kilometers per hour and car-free Sundays to save oil. Working from home up to three days a week where possible and car-free Sundays in cities rounded out the IEA's top three ideas. It's interesting that they would have this as their top three. Car-free Sundays. Such action can reduce the short-term use of 380,000 barrels per day of oil if implemented in large cities every Sunday. The amount drops to 95 if cities only instituted a plan for once a month. Car-free Sundays were introduced in countries such as Switzerland, Netherlands, West Germany during the 1973 oil crisis. Car-free Sundays help support the uptake of walking and cycling, which can generate a positive spillover effect throughout the week. Mm. So this is how they introduce it via the back door. Yeah, and when I read something like that and they say they did it in the 1973 oil crisis, it rings to me... They tested it if it will work then. And now they want to start crunching Implement it. it on a worldwide basis. But let's make sure that this is where they're heading. This is what the Pope said in 2013. Pope Francis has a few words in support of leisure. Responding to the question, do we need to rediscover the meaning of leisure? Pope Francis replied, together with a culture of work, there must be a culture of leisure as gratification. To put it another way, people who work must take the time to relax, to be with the families, to enjoy themselves, read, listen to music, play sport. But this is being destroyed in the large parts by the elimination of the Sabbath rest day. More and more people work on Sundays as a consequence of the competitiveness imposed by a consumer society. In such cases, he concludes, work ends up dehumanizing people. Again, of course, he confuses Sabbath with Sunday, but that is the nature of their theology. The idea of a Catholic exalting the Sabbath sounds particularly peculiar in the American context. In the United States, Catholics were never the great proponents of Sabbatarianism, observing Sunday as a special day for worship or rest. I think they are ill-informed. That was a Protestant thing. From the moment the Puritans arrived, they began enforcing laws to reserve Sunday for church-going. Over time, 
what came to be called blue laws, covered different activities and varied by state. Over time, the official justification for the laws had changed, but it was still Protestants who pushed for them. Now, Martin, this is very interesting. From the beginning, Protestantism has been confronted with the Sabbath issue. Karlstadt introduced this idea in the time of Luther, and there was great consternation, and many, many Protestants uh, were at loggerheads regarding this issue. And to this very day, you have groups within the Baptists also that keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, the Saturday. It's not only the Seventh-day Adventists. But as you know, the Roman Catholics have the law mm -hmm. that Sunday is their day of rest, right? Protestantism has incorporated that into their creeds. Yeah. They had an opportunity at the Council of Trent to take the position of sola scriptura and return to the true mm -hmm. Sabbath, but they didn't. So Protestants made this Sunday Sabbath their own, but it is a child of the papacy. Yes. And the Archbishop of Reggio plainly told them that their, their stance on sola scriptura is false because they adopt Sunday. So this is well known to them in their history. And then the Bible tells us mm -hmm. in Revelation chapter 13 that it will be the beast out of the earth, Protestant America, that will implement the mark of the beast and will Im implement Sunday legislation. And that will become universal. Now, has it become universal? Yes. It's, and it, that, even the history tells you, like this article mentions, it's always been Protestants that's once this ensconced in law, so they're doing the bidding of the beast. Now, it says that the second beast will do it on behalf of or before the first beast, yeah. which is Roman Catholicism. So she's been very clever. She's taking this backstage, and it doesn't seem to be her who's pushing it, but here he is openly advocating for it. And who will do his bidding? The Protestants. That's it. So about 250 bishops met in Rome for a conference on the movement called the New Evangelization, which focuses on reawakening faith in those already baptized. One of their conclusions was, even though there is a tension between the Christian Sunday and the secular Sunday, Sunday needs to be recovered. In keeping, they wrote, with John Paul's Dies Domini. Now, John Paul wrote this encyclical on Dies Domini, where he very clearly says that the state should enforce mm. Sunday legislation. And now we saw in China, if they are a model for this Catholic social doctrine, what they say will be okay to use, what, how it would look if they use that force. Now, they might not use the religious aspect. No. They will use the climate change aspect. That's it. So the secular Sunday will fall under climate change. Correct. And they will receive the mark on their hand. That's it. So, Martin, let's ask ourselves, has Rome changed its tune? No. The, yeah. the tune is still the same. The wording might be slightly different. Yes, because they have to soften it a little bit because there probably has been shows like ours that are troubling the water. But So here's Catholic news agency from... April 2022, Pope Francis, all countries should promote family-friendly policies. In the previous article, we saw he said that those family-friendly policies were the introduction of Sunday. That's it. So family-friendly social, economic, and cultural policies need to be promoted in all countries. That's an oblique way to ask for Sunday legislation. Yes. He said these include, for example, policies that make it possible to harmonize family and work, fiscal policies that recognize family burdens and support the educational functions of families by adopting appropriate instruments of fiscal equity, policies that welcome life and social, psychological and health services centered on support for couple and parental relationships, and 
all of those buzzwords have been linked to Sunday. 100, if you read the encyclical Laudato Si, it has the same wording, but it says that the Sunday has to be revered again. It has to be placed back into the center of society. That's where we're heading. And uh, this basically gives us an overview of where we are standing currently in terms of the prophetic picture. The mark of the beast will be implemented, whether we agree with it or not. It will be implemented on every social level. It will be universal. So you must have a universal binding force behind it. It will be draconian. Yes. Surveillance will be used. They've practiced draconian methods. Mm -hmm. They are pretty proficient. They're adding the technology in order to, to do this. Now is the time for God's people to spiritually prepare for what is coming. Martin, we need to study scripture. Mm. We need to have a change of heart. And it always starts with repent. That's it. And then after repentance, we need to have faith. Mm -hmm. Perfect faith drives out fear. fear. That when we have a right standing with God, we need fear nothing that is coming upon the world. But we need to be aware of what Scripture tells us. When the Christians were warned in the time of Christ that when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, let the, as written in the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And they did study. And they did understand. And they saw the signs. That's it. And they fled to Pella. It's time for God's people to be spiritually prepared for what is coming. So in our next discussion, perhaps we should look at the spiritual preparedness aspect. Because we don't want to be just a news organization. God's people need to get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, prophecy is fulfilling before our eyes. It's working in darkness and people are so distracted with this, that and the other. But this thread of prophecy runs through everything and should warn God's people as to where we are standing in the stream of time. Help us to be spiritually prepared is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.